American author Richard Bach once wrote, your only obligation in any lifetime is to be true to yourself. But is that true? If an obligation is a course of action to which a person is morally or legally bound, who can say that they don't owe a debt to anyone but themselves? And what Christian could ever claim their only obligation in life was to be true to themselves? Certainly not the Apostle Peter. Neither can you or I. If you want a fuller understanding of your obligations as a child of God, then keep listening because today, Vicki Hitzkiss, Kent Edwards, and Nathan Norman reveal the first of two obligations that the Apostle Peter says every child of God must embrace. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life, into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the book of First Peter. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to First Peter chapter 1, verse 10, to chapter 2, verse 1, as we join their discussion. Richard Bach's assertion that our only obligation in life is to be true to ourselves Quite frankly, I think it's as selfish as it is untrue. I mean, think about it. What obligations do you have? Oh, there's so many. If you're employed, you have an obligation to your employer. Sure. I'm, I freelance, so I have an obligation to every single person who hires me. Mm-hmm. I have a, a mother who is very old and mm-hmm. ill. I have an obligation to take care of her. Lots of, mm-hmm. all right. kinds of things. I got an obligation to the IRS. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Uh, you have if you have children, you have obligation to your children uh, as citizens of whatever state and country or province you happen to be in. Uh, you have obligations that you have to them. Yeah, I mean, uh, you cannot go through life without having multiple obligations in life, not just to yourself. So, my definition of obligation is considerably different than Mister Box. I might say, an obligation is a debt we owe to a person or organization who has given us something of value. And the greater the contribution that is made to us, the greater our obligation to respond. Hmm. So, I mean, just think about that, Vicki. You've talked in previous podcasts about the, the huge input that your parents have had in your life. And, and you would uh, be the first, I think, to say, that uh, your mom and dad had made a significant contribution to who you are today. Absolutely. I, I think because of that, like you, I would feel an obligation to look after my parents, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, in light of what they have done for me, I have an obligation to respond to their gift to me. So I may have a lesser implication to someone who stands next to me at a bus stop, but to my parents, oh yeah, because of what they have done, I have a greater thing. Likewise, I pay my mortgage every month because I am grateful that that company gave me the money to have a home. So I know I have an obligation to them to make sure that I pay them back with the interest we agreed on. I have an obligation to my country because I happen to enjoy living in a land of freedom. Because I've had the fortune to live in Canada and the United States, these are some of the greatest countries in the world. And people have bled and died in order for me to enjoy what I have. So I have an obligation to my country. People handed something to me, I have an obligation to them. The only place I see this definition break down is we have an obligation as Christians to love our neighbors and love our enemies. And they haven't done anything for us necessarily. I think of the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he, he had a person who would be almost considered his enemy, even though he didn't know him. And he stopped and he tended to him. And we're supposed to do likewise because of what has been done to us through Christ. That's a good observation. And I think that's why that call to how do we love our neighbors, where the Good Samaritan was the answer to that, uh, came after uh, our love for God. So the only way that we can ever minister to and reach out to those who are simply in need is because of our relationship with God who has reached out to us in our point of need. But we'll we'll be getting into that later in the podcast. Okay. 
So the Apostle Peter takes this understanding of obligation, the fact that when someone has invested significantly in our life, we are obligated to respond to that gift, and applies it to our salvation. For the past two weeks of our podcast, the Apostle encouraged the persecuted first century Jewish Christians by the, reminding them of the two great gifts that God had given them. Do you remember what those were? Yeah, it was adoption as a child of God and an inheritance in heaven that can never perish, spoil, or fade. So we can say that quickly, but <laughs> as we looked at our previous podcast, those are enormous gifts. To go from being a slave to sin and death, to be adopted by the King of Kings, to not only um, enjoy that position, but also can look forward to an inheritance as any child can from a good parent. Those are huge advantages. In fact, on a scale of one to 10, how significant would you say those gifts are for Peter's audience? 15, 28, <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs> and I would agree. Why? Why were these so significant for the original audience? Well, these are people who are living in exile. And so for many of them, they are Jewish believers in Christ. So their families have shunned them and kicked them out and basically have said, I have no parent, I have no son, I have no daughter. And so to lose a parent, but to be adopted by the God of the universe is very mm -hmm. significant. And, and in the same breath, they lost an inheritance, right? They, sure. they left their homes because of persecution or they got driven out of their homes and from their families because of persecution. And so they lost everything they spent their entire lives building. Uh, but there's an inheritance waiting for them. There's something on the other side that's far better than what they lost. And, and if they really believe it, they understand it's an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or mm. fade. Right. And, and yet, Peter goes even further when he talks to the first century Christians in verses 10 through 12. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. But you have now been told by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Isn't that amazing? He's saying not only has God given you these great gifts, but he has given you insight into the saving work of God that is greater than Moses had more detailed than Isaiah had, Jeremiah, or any of the Old Testament prophets. Your insight, your understanding of that uh, scarlet thread of salvation that began with the fall of humanity and of course all through the Bible and that will find fulfillment in the return of Christ, your understanding of that is uh, greater than anyone before you has had. Isn't that astounding? Even the angels, even the angels. Isn't that something? And by the way, that's not just them, that's us, right? Right. So we understand, because of what we've read in the New Testament, a far fuller understanding of the, of the tremendous grace of God that has been faithful throughout all generations. But Peter goes on to say, not only are you blessed because you know the details of God's saving work so well, but you also understand the depth, the enormity of Jesus' sacrifice for you, greater than anyone has had before. I mean, we see that in chapter 1, verse 18 through 21. He says, It was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed by the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but it was with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So your faith and hope are in God. Look at the details that he gives. We know that Abraham was told by God that uh, as he looked up to the stars in the sky and believed God's promise to him, that it would be credited to him as righteousness and all the world would be blessed through him. But he didn't know it would come in exactly this way, and at such an enormous cost. I mean, 
The people of Israel knew that in order to be forgiven of their sins, they at Passover would uh, sacrifice a lamb. But what they didn't know is that Jesus Christ, that was a prefiguring that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, would suffer and die and shed his blood for them. I mean, this, is, this isn't different than what God had said in the past, but it is far more intense. Yes, they know more details, but they, like we, we understand the depth, the enormity of Jesus' sacrifice. I mean, it just reminds me of that old hymn, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. You've heard that one before, right, Nathan? Yeah, going back a little bit of a little bit of time, but O Sacred Head Now Wounded, with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns, thine only crown. What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. One of the reasons that hymn speaks so clearly to me is because it not only tells me what Jesus did, it helps me feel the great sacrifice that Jesus did. That's what Peter wanted to emphasize for these ancient Christians and to us. So why is Peter hammering home his readers' in-depth understanding of God's rich plan for our salvation and the depth of suffering that Jesus suffered in the process? Well, it goes right back to the beginning that we were talking about obligation and the bigger the sacrifice Christ has made for us, the, the greater obligation we have to him. He's done all of this for us. How much more should we serve him? Right. Right. You think about, well, let me give you an example, a negative example. Uh, a number of years ago, this is not somebody that goes to my church currently, but a number of years ago, there was a guy <laughs> in the community who I helped out and I helped uh, him mm -hmm. through some stuff. And uh, I didn't know exactly where his standing was. He didn't seem the most spiritually mature, but he, he was kind of a big roller in the community and had a lot of influence. And so he showed up to the church one day and said, hey, this is for you. And I said, oh, what is it? And it was a giant pouch of cash. I think there was like $2,000 in it. Wow. He says, you helped me out so much, and I want to bless you with this. And immediately, I, I okay, this is great. It will help the church out greatly. No, no, no. This is a gift for you. And I made it very clear. If you hand me this money, I'm going to turn around and put it into the church treasury. Because, you know, he was trying to ultimately influence the church and influence individuals, and myself, and uh, I didn't want any part of it, right? Because I didn't want, want to be obligated to $2,000 in cash. And uh, if the IRS is listening, uh, <laughs> I, I handed it right to the secretary. We put it in the safe where the uh, the offerings go. We documented the snot out of that, that uh, uh, you know, Nathan merely touched it and handed it on. Um, we counted it together, you know, like all, all of the stuff on the up and up. But but I knew if I, and, and, and I even had individuals in the church who kind of heard about it. They're like, well, I think he wanted to bless you. And you spent a lot of time working with them. And I said, I get that. I understand it. I appreciate it. But everything within me was screaming, if you take any of that, you are obliged to him. And I don't want anything to do with that. So, so I just got rid of it. <laughs> but in a positive sense, right here, Christ, he's done so much. And if we accept his gift of salvation, like how, how, how can we not be helped but overcome with love that, that this loving God has given everything for us? And of course, we're obliged to him and we should be obliged to him. And, and unlike uh, individuals, he's not trying to, or certain individuals, he's not trying to manipulate or control us. He wants to enter in a deeper love relationship with us. Right. The greater the gift, the greater the obligation. Right. And I think that's exactly Peter's point. Christ's humiliation, torture, and death on our behalf has made, uh, makes us obligated to him. The larger the gift, the greater the obligation. So if, if, if Peter is outlining how much we've been given, what is our obligation? How should we respond? What is our number one obligation to him? Well, look at verses 14 and following, because here he comes to application. He says, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. 
For you know that it is not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Do you see the clear connection Peter brings here? Yeah. Because of what Christ has done for you, this is to be our response. The implication being, if we don't live out a holy life as he has called us to, then what does that mean? Well, either we don't care or we're not really saved. It's an insult to the work of Christ. It is an evil thing to receive so much and fail to respond. So let me ask you a question. Does the evangelical church take sin seriously today? I'm really curious to see what Vicky's answer is to this. Are you? Yeah. No, I was. <laughs> I feel. I feel like your perspective is better than mine because I'm. I'm in the meat making process, right? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm. I'm in the thick of it. No, I. I don't think they do. Not like even when I was growing up, when mm -hmm. there was black and there was white. Now it seems like there's a lot of gray, and I think unfortunately Christians buy into the gray. Why do you think that is? I think because we buy into culture. I think TV has saturated our minds and what is okay in the culture and what has become legal, we think that's okay. Mm. And it's not okay. We right. need to look. I don't, I don't mean to sound like, well, I do mean to sound like that. I was going to say like a religious <laughs> zealot, but, but I do mean to sound like that. If the Bible says something is wrong, it's wrong. And because society says it's okay, it doesn't make it okay. Because something is now legal, it doesn't make it okay. If the Bible says something is wrong, it's wrong. And we need to know that and obey that. And we need to stand up for it. And that's hard. Mm. Oh, yeah. You're just going to get raked through the coals. And I, I can't reiterate enough that the law is the absolute bottom of morality. Just because something <laughs> is legal does not mean yeah. it is moral. It is the absolute bottom of morality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there's also been a massive exaggeration of uh, the grace of God. I think we've gone to the point where people assume that no matter what they do, a silent prayer to an invisible God takes away any and all consequences mm. of what they have done. You know, I just think of Paul in Romans 6 saying, um, do we, because of grace, should sin abound? No, 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 no. It's fascinating to me that Jesus calls people like John the Baptist did to repent, to uh, publicly turn away to deal with sin, not just thinking there are no consequences, but, um, but realizing the seriousness of offending the holy God who has called us and given his life for us so that we could live a holy life and all the benefits that come with that and turn away and say, sin doesn't matter. I, I, I found it interesting that uh, I was reading an article that said in Las Vegas, Nevada, Nearly one in three Christians attend a church with at least a thousand attendees. Wow. A lot of people in Las Vegas go to church, which is great. But, but a study this year, which used 47 key indicators of immoral and illicit behavior, ranging from violent crimes per capita to excessive drinking to gambling disorders and many other things, ranked Nevada as the most sinful state in the U.S. Mm. <laughs> which does not mean mega churches are bad. I'm not trying to say that. But it may suggest that the level of church attendance does not indicate holiness. Mm. And uh, Vicki, I know you're wondering, Texas came in number three on the list. Oh, wow. And Texas has a lot of churches. I also found it interesting that in a Pew Research study of U.S. churches, the, the person who did the study indicated that you had only a 3% chance to hear either the word sin or salvation in a sermon in the U.S. Isn't that something? That just is mind-boggling. Which means that you would hear the words sin or salvation in only one or two sermons in an entire year. Wow. And right now, most people consider regular church attendance once every three to four weeks. <laughs> so chances are you're not even going to hear it. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. So there's little wonder. Wow. Wow. that there is not the emphasis. 
There's emphasis on how to live your best life, how to succeed in various areas of life, but not with sin, not with repentance. So you can't be preaching through the Bible and and not talking about sin. You can't get around it if you're actually preaching the word without kind of cherry picking ideas or thoughts. Like You just can't get away. You can't no. get away. Which is one reason in Crosstalk, I highly recommend people preach through books of the Bible. Right. So that what's, we, what's incredible we with that is like, you know, now that I, I preach through all these books, it's like, man, I don't want to preach this text this week, right? Because it's a hard text <laughs> and it's uncomfortable. And all you tell the congregation, I'm not comfortable. They're not comfortable. Nobody's comfortable. We're all convicted. It's hard. <laughs> but it, but it's changing. It's life changing. It is. It's transformative. It is. And it's necessary because according to Peter, sin is serious. I mean, look at what he says in chapter one, verses 15 and 17. Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So that's not compromise. That's saying if you've been saved by a holy God and he has given you all that he's given you and you understand that, that calls you, you are obligated to live a holy life. And if you choose not to, the father judges impartially. In other words, not only to people who go to church, uh, who don't go to church, but also people who do go to church. Because a holy God needs, demands, is obligated to receive from us a life of holiness. Which kind of reminds me of Hebrews 10, right? Do you remember those verses? Yeah, it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. That's sobering. But only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. And really, that makes sense. One thing we know about God is he is holy, right? Yeah. And you cannot... A sinful creature cannot exist in the presence of holiness. Holiness is like a raging fire. It will consume all evil in his presence. So it's not that God becomes our enemy. It's that we become, if we tolerate sin in our life, it becomes easy for us. We can excuse it. We can swim in it without difficulty. That means that as sinners, we cannot exist in the presence of a holy God. Well, in sin... It puts up a barrier between me and God and my relationship with him as a believer, Mm -hmm. right? It's not God doing it. I've put up the barrier. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if Peter has told us here in unambiguous terms that in light of all that God has given us, we are obligated, our first obligation is to live a holy life. How can we help our listeners? I mean, all of us are sinners, right? Every one of us struggles with sin, even... Paul said in Romans chapter 7, that what I want to do, sometimes I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do. I mean, even he struggled with sin. So how, what practical advice uh, can we give to our listeners in how to gain victory over sin? Willpower, try harder. (laughs) Well, I don't want to (laughs) underestimate that um, because sanctification requires work, right? Correct, yes. But we don't have to do it alone. Yes, amen. Do you remember? I, I think the problem, though, is that we often try to do it alone. We try to do it on mm-hmm. our own power and our own strength, and then we get frustrated, so then we give up. But the reality is, is that we are not alone and we are not powerless. Uh, we have God, the Holy Spirit, who dwells within us, and He is our helper. He is our constant companion to overcome sin and strife, and uh, we are able to call on Him at any time and every time for help. Mm-hmm. Uh, and He and, will. And He will. And He does. And I'm reminded that uh, Paul wrote to the Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and so on, which means that the work of the Spirit in us naturally produces this fruit. Yes, it takes effort, but yes, it is also the work of God. And that's a resource we can call out to him for help. And that's available to us. But another piece of advice might be, let's deal honestly and openly with our sin. At least my experience is that many Christians hide and uh, pretend that they do not struggle with sin. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, they run to hide it instead of openly confessing it. But in James 5, uh, James tells us, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. Because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. 
I think one of the most effective ways that we can deal with sin is to repent of those sins, to confess our sins one to another. I mean, that's how you gain entrance into the church, right? Nathan, you're a good Baptist. <laughs> what do you have to do to become a member? What is necessary to become a member of a Baptist church? Right. They have to uh, share their testimony. They have to be baptized, uh, in which they confess that uh, they've confessed their sins and that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for their sins and rose again. And that's the entrance requirement, just as John the Baptist said. Mm -hmm. um, repentance for sin publicly is important, but I'm not sure it ends there. Right. I think that's uh, the secret of the 12 step program that so many are familiar with dealing with addiction. That one of the things, one of the requirements for people in that program is to go to the people that they have hurt, tell them that they have hurt them, confess that sin, because that's such a difficult process and no one wants to do it, that that's incentive not to go back into that sinful behavior again. Yeah. I, you know, I, this text in particular and conversations I've had with Vicki uh, have really, uh, I don't know, helped solidify thoughts and, and conversations with you as well, Kent, that, you know, I think large part, the Protestant evangelical church, uh, this is one of our major flaws is that we just, we put this facade on and we don't have to confess our sins to each other. I just go to God and say, hey, I messed up. And then we try to do better. And when we continue to mess up, we're like, what's going on? And I think this is what we're missing here is that we don't confess our sins to one another. And sin is like fungus. It mm -hmm. thrives in darkness mm -hmm. and poop. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's how it grows. And, and that's what our sin is like. And the best thing to do is to shed light on it. And I think that's where you see all of these scandals coming out of the evangelical church, my own denomination, where it starts off with you know a, a pastor or a leader saying, man, I'm, I'm really lusting after this individual. And rather than confessing his violation of the 10th commandment, not to, not to covet, uh, he just hides it and tries to fight against it in his own power and own will, rather than going to some brothers and saying, hey, I'm struggling here, and this is my sin that I'm confessing to you. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, there is something amazing that happens when you confess your sins to brothers and sisters, and they affirm to you, your sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Go mm -hmm. and sin no more. And in fact, I know for myself in my own personal ministry, you know, there used to be, I used to do like accountability groups with guys, usually over like, you know, online stuff or, or mm -hmm. um, you know, some certain kind of substance abuse, uh, although that usually takes uh, more uh, professional help. But, but, you know, I used to do accountability stuff. I rarely will do that anymore. Now it's like, look, and you mess up, you give me a call and you confess your sin and mm -hmm. I will remind you of your, your salvation in Christ and your forgiveness in Christ and tell you to go and sin no more. And that works so much more. And I've worked it, made sure every time we take the Lord's Supper, as we take it to say your sins are forgiven in Christ, uh, to remind us that this is this is how we're forgiven, is, is through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, not through you know, our own human effort or by looking the part or allowing sin to, to just be hidden enough. Because once you hide it enough, it grows, that lust grows into you know, sexual abuse ultimately. And, uh, and it's not good. Sin thrives in darkness. Yeah. Let's not forget the sober warning of this passage. Peter is telling the ancient readers and us that because we know the details and depth of Christ's sacrifice so that we could know salvation from our sins, if knowing all that, we insult our Savior by tolerating or encouraging sinful behavior, we will face the consequences of our sin. He judges us all impartially. God may not be cruel or capricious, but don't pretend he isn't dangerous. God's goodness obligates us, all of us, to a life of holiness. We have been bought with a price, and that comes with an obligation. We are obligated to live a holy life. I trust that today's discussion of God's Word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the Word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's Word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more, 
or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by sharing it on your social media and telling your friends. Tune in next Friday as we continue our discussion through 1 Peter. Be sure to join us. Are we are we being Christians? Are we going to be judged? I thought we were forgiven, clean pass. Oh, we are, but um, there are always consequences for sin, even for forgiven people, right? So, consequences, yes, but but after we die, or are we going to be judged? Well, my answer to that is I am safe and secure. My salvation is eternal. I have the Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing my inheritance. But all truth in the Bible is held in tension. Mm -hmm. So if you choose to live like the devil, I mean, willfully, continually, God doesn't care if you raised your hand at summer camp. Um, right. He's giving you- Your life give, change. Right. Sure. And, and so people will say, well, you never were a Christian. I don't think that squares with the Bible. I think there are people who, who did have the Holy Spirit, like Saul. Uh, was filled with the Spirit, he prophesied and so on, but clearly walked away from God in every way that he could. And I think that's why you have Hebrews 10 and others. So I'm not, am I eternal security or you can lose your salvation? And that's yes. Um, I don't I don't fear losing my salvation. I think we're all going to stand before God with the judgment of works. That's clear. But, uh, but I do not fear standing and wondering whether I'll be saved unless I have chosen to live a life that is absolutely contrary, without resistance, to uh, uh, to the clear uh, teaching of, of God on the, in the area of sin. So, yeah, I I do think that um, that all truth is held in tension. He is omniscient, but um, he chooses to remember our sin no more. He is uh, transcendent, and he is imminent. He is gracious and forgiving, and uh, he punishes the sins of the father to the tenth generation. And and I think the reason why we struggle with that often is that in the heritage of our Western theologians, we come with a true false binary understanding of God. If one thing is true, the other one can't be true. Um, whereas when I work with cross stock people around the world. They don't come with a logic approach to understanding God. They see God as a person. And in the same way that people hold characteristics that are intention, so can God. So is my wife faithful to me? And will she stick with me in spite of my failings? Yes, she has. <laughs> That's why I'm still married. Um, but is it possible for me to live in a way that she would not be faithful to me? Yes, it is, right? So people have uh, truth and tension, and we see that all the time. And God is a person, and I think we need to understand him as that, not as a computer program. So what you're saying is we are secure in our salvation in Christ, mm -hmm. and if we intentionally become his enemy, uh, we are not in Christ. Right. I'm not saying we don't struggle with sin. Well, and that's the difference is there is a struggle. huge difference between struggling with sin and giving into sin, right? Absolutely. And so Absolutely. when I'm working with usually, you know, married couples and the husband's looking at online pornography, the main marker I'm looking at, is he struggling with it or he just doesn't want to deal with consequences anymore? Because if he's struggling and hates it, but doesn't have the power to overcome it, well, that we can all work with, Right. Right. If he just wants his wife to shut up and stop looking at his internet search history, that's a problem. Right. Pretty much it's over, right? You, you, you can't work with that. Right. Uh, and there's a world of difference between those two things. It might not seem like it. The usage might be the same. The, the websites might be the same, but it is a massive difference between hating your sin and lacking the power to uh, overcome it and, uh, and loving your sin and wanting everyone to shut up about it. Right. It's like... Uh if I don't do well in math, is it because I don't care and don't do my work? Or is it because I'm struggling with the concepts and trying very hard to understand what is abstract and difficult for me to comprehend? Yeah, that's a good metaphor.
Yeah, we don't like those. Uh, <laughs> we don't like that tension, Kent.